Mark Lawrenson is with us to discuss. Good morning to you, Mark. Morning. Was that first half performance from Liverpool the worst this season? Oh, good question. Um, possibly, well, it's, it's up there, certainly. I think you have to take into account the quality of the opposition, but it would be in the top three, most definitely, yes. I would say uh, the, the Villa game and uh, the first half last night, probably up there in the, yeah. the, the top two, maybe. Uh, let, let's just focus straight in on Trent Alexander-Arnold, Mark, because this has been a conversation that isn't a new one. It's been had quite a bit over the last week, especially in the context of what Squad England might send to the Euros. In your opinion, what has happened to him and why has there been a dip in his performances so dramatically? Right, well, I don't think anything's particularly happened to him in the way that he goes forward, as we saw with his cross for a, for a Jota in the Arsenal game. I think defensively he's always been a little bit suspect. Um, he's one of those who, obviously, because he's really, really quick, he gambles with the fact that he can get back if he makes a mistake because of his pace. But I would say the biggest thing would be, of course, without, without a Gomez... Um, and obviously Van Dijk, etc., alongside him, he's, he's shaky anyway because the, the two guys who, who are currently playing at the moment, Kabak and, and Phillips, they're just finding their way through in terms of the, their own form and obviously you know, playing at that level. And every mistake he's made at the moment has, has basically cost Liverpool a goal. Now, what, what do you do? Do you take him out? Uh, give him a bit of a rest, or, or do you leave him in? I mean, it's it's a dilemma, obviously, that, that Klopp's going to have to deal with. There was a couple of moments in the second half where he was pinging cross-field passes. There was that incident with Vinicius as well, where he like flings an arm back, and he's angry. Like I yeah. think that's probably what you want to see at this point, Mark, it is a bit of anger and a bit of fire in the belly of, of Trent Alexander-Arnold. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely, definitely. But you just, you've got to be careful. You just don't step the line a little bit in, in, in too much. Obviously, it costs you even more. He's frustrated. That, that's basically what it is. And, you know, he's still, he's still a relatively young player who's, who's come an awful long way, as, as everybody knows. He'll get better. He'll improve. Um, but I'm not sure. Certainly, you know, looking at, looking at the second leg next week, do you take him out? Do you gamble? Um, play somebody even younger and even more experienced? So... That's obviously the issue for, for, the, for the manager at the moment. But what you've got to be very, very careful with with him is obviously just completely destroy his confidence. I mean, that might take him ages to kind of get that back. So ah, it's, uh, you're walking on, on the glass at the moment with him, most definitely. What would you even do in that situation if Jurgen Klopp was to take him out? Like, does it, does it fit James Milner maybe we ch challenge him for, for that position? Yeah, um, yeah, po yeah, possibly, possibly. I mean, I don't know because because I think Liverpool obviously need to score for the for the second leg, and I, I think you'd leave them in, yeah. and you just you, you just take a chance that Liverpool will have most of the possession at home against Madrid, and we'll we'll be forcing them back, and you need you need that quality of his crossing down the right hand side, as of course Robertson down down the left. So I think that's what you. you if I were a club, that's what I would probably do. Um, but I think he's probably, a, as much as anything now, with, with, it's, it, this, is, this is where my management comes into all this, and he's normally brilliant at this club. And, and, you know, I think the manager's probably just going to sit him down and tell him that he's an absolutely brilliant player. Um, he's forever in his plans. He's had, you know, he's got no intention of leaving him out. And that might be the difference. But he's, he's never been... You would never, when you when you describe Trent Alexander Arnold over, say, last season, the season before, season before that, you say he's, he's a wonderful attacking fullback, and, and therein lies the problem. He's just he is really just an attacking fullback, and defensively, he, he's not great. But as I said before, when he when he's got people like Gomez and, and Van Dijk next to him, they've ab obviously kind of compensated for him. I mean. When I played in those in, in many, many years ago, as you know, Phil, Phil Neal, who was an outstanding footballer, he wouldn't, our, our right back at the time, he wouldn't have been recognised as one of the best defensive full backs. And if you're a centre back, you're playing alongside someone like that, you just take half a yard of a step nearer to him just in case he makes a mistake. And listen, it's, it's something that you've got to deal with. I mean, nobody alive has ever been born who's absolutely, totally complete footballer, whoever doesn't make a mistake, certainly defensively. And at the moment, every time he makes a mistake, it costs Liverpool a goal. That's the point, isn't it, as well? That's, he's almost got 
a little bit unlucky on top of some poor performances and it's just this uh, catalogue of errors then. Like, when it comes to then the, the medium-term plan with Alexander-Arnold at Liverpool, say if he doesn't make the Euros this summer and, and, and he, he has the summer off, or even if he comes back from the Euros, is there something that the Liverpool coaching staff can do to ensure that he's a more solid right back or is it just batting down the hatches, hope for Gomez and Van Dijk to come back to full fitness quickly and just get back to where he was last season and not have to worry about Alexander-Arnold as a, as a defending full-back all the time? Yeah, I think, I, think absolutely, I think I'm absolutely right in terms of having to worry about the other thing. Privately, if you ask the manager that, uh, that and say to him, suggest to him that that uh, Trent's not going to go and play in the Euros, he'd be absolutely delighted because he's thinking yeah. he's getting a massive rest. You know, and that's the other thing. He's, he's virtually played nearly every single game for Liverpool. And, and what happens is you come in and, you know, he's been brilliant, to be honest with you. Absolutely fabulous. He's been a massive bonus for them because they thought he was going to be a good player. They didn't realise how good a player he was, he was going to become. And, and at some stage, you hit the wall. And then it's a case of how do you deal with it? You know, I'm sure I'm sure they work on him in training. I'm pretty sure they work, but it's training and playing are completely different. And if you're just a little bit short on confidence when you're defending, and it's one of those, you know, do you stick or do you twist? And sometimes when you twist, it, it costs you, and it costs you in terms of a goal against your side. And all of a sudden, you look very, very, you look a very, very average player. But it's something that he's definitely not. So they just, it's one of those that you just ride through and. Um, it happens to absolutely everybody. I mean, even the king himself, Kenny Dalglish, I remember once he had about a three or four months time where he'd been injured and he came back and he really, really struggled. And everyone says, well, what's the matter with him? What's the matter with him? Well, he's just, just having one of those times where, it, where it's not working. And as I said to you before, it does happen with everybody. Mark, um, just one final one on this. I'd like to kind of just hear from, from your perspective when you're watching football. Um, the first two Madrid goals, the passes from Tony Kroos. So it was obviously a, a tactic from Madrid to go over the top yesterday. Yeah. When you're watching those goals in real time, are you sitting there as an analyst, as a football fan, as somebody who's played the game, are you going, what a pass by Tony Kroos? Or are you thinking immediately, Quebec and Phillips, their positioning is all off there? Listen, if, 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 if it's against Man United and Man City, I'm thinking, absolutely brilliant, well done, Tony Kroos. But if it's your own team, you think, yeah, Crikey, um, should have, should have been positioning sel ourselves m much better. Listen, I uh, I read a piece yesterday before the game by uh, Benitez by Rafa, and I don't know if any of you saw it. And basically, he was he was assessing the Madrid team, and he just said, "Look," he said, "Cruz, Modric, Casemiro." He said, "If you don't get on top of them and stop them playing, you're going to be in all sorts of problems." And of course, that's exactly what happened, wasn't it? And do you think, Mark, because when I'm sitting here now thinking about it, to me, the Naby Keita decision was a weird one. Is that what Klopp had in mind when he was picking Naby Keita to start yesterday? No, I think, I think the, the premise of picking him <coughs> excuse me, was that Klopp's, Klopp identified and his staff identified that, that, that when, when uh, Madrid don't have the ball, they're a little bit kind of, they, they man-mark, they pick up the, the guy closest to them. And Naby Kate is known supposedly as a, a really good dribbler of the ball. I have to say, I haven't really seen it since he's been at Liverpool. And I think I think Klopp's idea was that be, being that way, he could dribble past his man and then obviously free somebody else up coming forward. But it so didn't work. And of course, when you take him off just before half time as well, it just it's like that great big finger of blame pointing at you. And um, but it's going to be a difficult one for for for, for Kate to certainly to play in the team again, and for and for Klopp to get his confidence back. He avoided pointing the finger of blame at him then in the post-match press conference, as you can imagine, Mark. He said uh, Naby wasn't responsible for the first half performance. Mm. He didn't play for a while, especially not from the start, and we were not good in the game. It seems like a mad decision to make if you're already aware that he hasn't played for a while, especially not from the start, because as you say there running is supposed to be the part of his game. And if there's somebody who's not fully match fit, can mm. they really get the most out of themselves as a runner? Well, uh, it's a gamble that you take, isn't mm. it? I mean, if you, you come off and you win 2-0, you're, you're absolutely brilliant in terms of a manager. Um, and I think, I think, look, you know, the, the thing with football nowadays is that when, when you play against the opposition, you, you assess them to death. You, you look at, you know, the last five games, ten games, look at every single player 
strengths and weaknesses and all those kind of things. And I think that the backroom staff and the manager thought, you know what, this this could be the day for Naby Keita, even if we only give him kind of 65, 70 minutes, he might be the difference. But it, it probably was the difference in regards to the performance at Arsenal because he just wasn't at it. It's a gamble that's failed, basically. And, hey, um, managers make mistakes all the time. And when, 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 they, when they kind of make changes and they work, they're brilliant. And when they don't, they're idiots. That's basically the way that everybody <laughs> looks at it. Uh, you mentioned there that I guess the decision made sense pre-match uh, when you look at how Real Madrid behave when they're out of possession. But yeah. as Tommy mentioned there, when Real Madrid are in possession, they're a completely different beast altogether. So uh, was, it, was it a bit of a shock to you that Liverpool perhaps weren't brilliant without the ball last night or weren't closing that midfield down as, with, with as much hunger as you might expect? Yes, uh, yes, a little bit. But it's, it's one of those, isn't it? Because obviously they, they were without Varane and, and Ramos, Madrid. And so you're thinking, will Liverpool absolutely, totally press completely? Um, you know, and try and, play, try and play, obviously, in Madrid's half. But you do forget that, you know, people like Cruz and, and Modric have, have been outstanding players for years and Casemiro's no Morgan and they've, they've got their own plan and, and basically Liverpool's failed and, and, and Madrid's didn't. And sometimes you can, you can analyse football and, and the way that you play and tactics to the nth degree, but occasionally, occasionally you can get it wrong insofar as and you were beaten by a better team. Look, Three three one could have been five one, so at least you, yeah. you get out of t you get out of town with with, with an away goal, um, and obviously you know next Wednesday completely different game, but it, but as we know, um, no crowd at Anfield absolutely massive, you know thousands of Liverpool supporters will be thinking Barcelona, happy days, I don't I don't see that happening next week at all, and I think that uh, because. At the moment, Liverpool struggle defensively and they're not at the very best. I would expect Madrid to score an away goal. Mark, I've, I've two quick ones for you. We yeah. spent a lot of time in the build-up um, and I don't know whether it was pie in the sky stuff, but trying to find a way to get Jada and the big three, Mane, Salah and Firmino on the field together. Um, did you think that there was any chance they're probably going to do that in the build-up to the first game? And do you think that maybe Klopp just needs to go for it like that in the second game? Or is that just is there a way of making that work? Well, let's answer the, the last question uh, or the second question first, which is I think you'll have to go that way in, in, in the second game because it's, you know, SH1T or bust, isn't it? So that, that's mm. the answer to that. I think, I think it's difficult, um, you know, because they, they go to Arsenal and, and they look really, really good. And obviously you're kind of thinking, well, one of the things with Jota is you, you, you bring him on and he causes all sorts of, all sorts of problems. It's it, it's it's a difficult one. I mean, then what do you do in terms of the midfield? When if you've got sort of you've got three up front and one behind, what mm. do you do with the midfield when you look at the performances of Casemiro? And you know, as we said about uh, said about Modric and Cruz, because you don't want them coming to Anfield and having a little bit of space in which to pass the ball, and that they'll pass you to death. So ah, that's uh, that's one for Klopp, I'm afraid. So. Yeah. We, yeah. We'll we, we, we wait and see. I mean, we we know at home that Liverpool will press and they will press, and Madrid know that Liverpool will press. Um, and obviously, you know, much was made about the fact that no Varane and Ramos. It didn't really affect them too much, and might affect them more in the second leg. But as I say, it's a, it, it's a serious mountain to climb that fixture. Are you a fan of the uh, the curly finger before half time? A player getting subbed off in the forty second minute? I don't know. I know you're a, a big fan of or you're a connoisseur of quality TV. I don't know if you've been watching Ted Lasso, Mark. Um, but uh, in episode five of Ted Lasso, he pulls the same trick. Forty second minute, he pulls off one of the stars players and he gets a he gets a response in the second half. I don't know, has Klopp been watching Ted Lasso? I don't know. But like <laughs> no, he, he got a response after half time. Else, but... <laughs> Yeah, hey, get on it, Mark. I'm telling you, Owen's not a right. fan, but uh, you know, we're telling you, Nathan Murphy thinks it's a quality show as well. So, like, okay. have you seen that work uh, as a player, as a manager, as a pundit? Do you, are you a fan of it, or does it matter? Is it, is it just Klopp making a statement? Oh, um, it, it's a strange one when you when, when you take a player off. What was it? Five minutes before half time. That's that's really really strange. I'm not quite sure what you're saying, and and obviously 
he knew straight away what the questions would be, Jurgen Klopp, about Cater because, you know, he said he, he wasn't to blame. Yes, he wasn't playing very well, but he wasn't to blame. It was my fault. But I, I just find that was, that one a strange thing in terms of just five minutes from half time. It kind of highlights even more that, that uh, he didn't think Cater was playing particularly well. I mean, it's different if you come out for the second half and he's been re- replaced because you kind of think, well, yeah, that was going to happen. And then, mm. then your argument is, well, if that was going to happen, why didn't he take him off earlier? So, look, it, it, it's just it's just one of them. And I mean, Naby Keita's hardly hardly played for a long, long time. It was a decision that that the manager just got wrong, um, and basically he's kind of admitting to that. So, hey, move on. Uh, Klopp was making a point afterwards as well last night, Mark, that Sadio Mane just couldn't catch a break whatsoever when it came to the referee. There was a, a foul in the build-up to, to one of the Madrid goals. When it comes to Mane himself, though, is his form a concern if you're a Liverpool fan? Well, it, it's a concern because for the previous three and a half or even longer, three and three quarter years, he's been absolutely brilliant. And again, he's just one who's going through this, this, this little spell where it's not quite happening for him. But it's like, I, I think I've already said this to you guys before. It's, it's one of those, if you said tomorrow, right, um, any team in the world would, can come and sign Sadio Mane, there'd be a massive queue. Because he's just an, an outstanding player, an outstanding attacking player, who also gives you loads in terms of defensively. And he's, he's, a, he's a beast, he's strong, and he's been brilliant for Liverpool. But he's just just sort of 10% off it. And at this level, 10% off it... At, the level these boys play, it, it's very, very obvious that he's just not quite at his best. But what do you do? Would you leave Marnie out? No, you wouldn't leave Marnie out because he just has this, so much quality. But also, you know, in terms of running backwards to pull up all the team, it gives you an awful lot. So it's one of those you've got to deal with. How do you get confidence? Well, you only get confidence by working hard. And, you know, the harder you work, normally the better you become. Just on uh, Manchester City then, last night, Mark, to wrap up. Uh, got the job done in the end on the night, but you can never be confident that they're anywhere near the, the final hurdle when it comes to the tie. Guardiola said we're absolutely going to Germany to win, not to defend. We're going to adjust our high pressing. We're going to adjust our build-up. We're going to adjust our off-the-ball movement. So he's already got the plan picked out for the second leg here, Mark. Is, is there a chance here that they bottle it once again on a big European night? No, I don't think they'll do it. I think, uh, I mean, I don't think they'll bottle it. I think they'll get through. I mean, he, 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 the problem with, with, uh, with Guardiola sometimes, sometimes, as good a manager as he is, and he's, there's, there's no argument about that, he, he comes across sometimes as the most cleverest person in the room at school. Um, and we saw with Leon last year, uh, you know, in the, in the Champions League, where he made a mistake in the way that he, that, he, that he sent out his team to play. I don't get that with him this year. I, I think there are a lot lot better, you know, crikey, they've played loads of games without a striker and just absolutely battered teams. I think I think they'll go to Dortmund, and I, I honestly believe that Dortmund will do well to get the ball off City because one of those where you know you've got a really good side and you go away from home against a team who you think could possibly beat you, it's when all the top players show why they're top players and, you know, the, the form that De Bruyne is in and, and Foden and people like that. I see Manchester, Manchester City cruising through the return leg. Jude Bellingham's got an unbelievably bright future, to say the least, Mark. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's frightening, isn't it? Mm. For, for, for one so young, you kind of look at him, and, and I'm just jealous. I'm thinking, how the hell have you got so much ability? At what? What was he? Seventeen? Mm. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I don't, I, don't, yeah, I don't think I'd even shave by then. So I mean, what a player <laughs> he's going to be. <laughs> Yeah, 17, he turns 18 this summer. Unbelievable talents, and yeah. like when you look, look at that uh, combination. The, the terrifying thing, actually, last night was thinking about what would happen if you had Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne on the same team, because you'd have this combination of unbelievably proficient, angry players as well, and De Bruyne was just so good. Uh, you, you almost sometimes forget to, to give him the credit he deserves since City are running away with the title this season. Ah, uh, well, it's just, I mean... He's obviously got fantastic ability and, and he's been brilliant and he'll, he'll walk away with, with player of the season, I would have thought, as well. But it's, it's, it's the things that he sees that, you know, and he, he makes these passes and you're thinking, how, how on earth did he see that? And, and on, when you watch on telly, we can see those things. 
you know. But, but he's he's already done them, and you must you must remember what, at sort of ground level when he gets a ball, all all he generally would see is just a, a, a forest or a sea of opposition players, and then all of a sudden he picks his pass out. You think, oh my God, this fa- this fellow's not normal. He really seriously isn't. And the thing with him as well is. He looks a really, really nice guy and all that, but he's got fire in his belly. Um, mm. You know, he's, he's, I would say he's probably the best, he's probably the best player in the world at this moment. Probably, I can't get an argument from two of the many people at, at, at this time that he's not. Mark, myself and Owen struggled to dual screen it last night and watch both games, so apologies <laughs> for putting you on the spot here and you didn't get to see this, but... The Erling Haaland chance that he fashioned out of nothing in the in the start of the second half, um, it was kind of frightening. I just wanted to ask you, um, if you didn't see it, no problem, you can you can bat this one away. But he floors Ruben Diaz with a shoulder. Can you remember getting floored by a, a fella like Erling Haaland when you were playing? Did that happen, or were yourself and the likes of Hansen just able to to outman any forwards that come up against you, or were they much more in the style like Erling Haaland back in the eighties? Yeah, no, I think they were probably more in the style without the ability. They were all, every, every centre forward or every team in, in the league seems to have an assassin, whether it's Mickey Hartford or Joe Jordan or somebody like that who just wanted to bat you. Um, mm. So no, no way of the ability of, of Haaland. And listen, you know, I, he was, I think until uh, I read a piece at 16, 17, he was still very, very slight. And obviously he's just completely... Bulk up, so, so so to bulk up and have all that ability as well is it, just is just amazing. But also a subtle touch. So as as we know, I mean, you know, he's the talking person, the talking point at the moment for everybody else about where he's going to go. And if you had 150 million and you owned a football club, you'd buy him tomorrow. Yeah, no question about that. Uh, Mark Lawrenson, great stuff. Pleasure. Thanks, a million. Mark Lawrenson there on the line, reflecting on the win for Manchester City, the defeat for Liverpool, the second legs coming thick and fast. It's uh, next Wednesday is when you'll see the return legs of those fixtures.